when I first discovered Subnautica, I took interest in various components of the game, but it was when I saw the base building that I truly became captivated. Compared to the rustic, ramshackle feel of most survival games, Subnautica's base components are sleek, modern, and offer seemingly endless potential despite their modular design. Barely a few hours later, I had purchased the game, and base building quickly became a major focus. While my love for building has remained ever-present, I often feel disheartened seeing other players relegate their bases to sterile husks, used merely as a means to an end as they pursue other ventures. In this video, I am going to take you through my 5-step base building process as we construct a base and explore one of Subnautica's greatest aspects. Step 1. Location It might seem a bit strange to find this part difficult, but when I first started playing the game, I would often find myself idly scratching my head for hours on end, not knowing where I wanted to build my base, nor what I actually wanted to build when I got there. To simplify the process, I like to break down Subnautica bases into three main types. First are primary bases. You will usually only build one of these per world, and they are the largest of the three base types, needing to contain ample supplies of food, power, storage, and much more. However, since this base will be your main hub of operations, its potential locations are a bit more limited. After all, having your main base in the Lost River is great, until you have to go literally anywhere that isn't the Lost River. For that reason, I recommend you place your primary base somewhere within a kilometer of the map's center. Next up are outposts. These are the most utilitarian of the three, being useful as a place to recharge vehicles, eat food, or even serve as a jumping off point to explore more treacherous regions. Outposts are best when built along the paths you travel most often, such as the Lost River Corridor, an active lava zone, or adjacent to a particular biome that you frequent. The observatory is perhaps the complete opposite of the outpost. Choosing to forego much practical purpose, observatories are instead built with an emphasis on a region's unique terrain, flora, fauna, or all of the above. Because they aren't meant to be super functional, observatories can be built almost anywhere that the player deems acceptable, serving as a unique opportunity to safely experience everything a biome has to offer. For this build, I decided to make a primary base in the southwestern Grassy Plateaus biome. Step 2. Materials Having a plan for a base is great, but you won't ever actually get anything built if you don't have the right materials. A good three quarters of your base will be made up of two resources, titanium and quartz. Copper is the next most useful being needed for picture frames and computers. Lithium and lead are close behind, used in making hull reinforcements and foundations respectively. Gold, silver, ruby, and uranite are needed in smaller quantities, but are essential for certain computer components and power sources. Enameled glass is needed for any observatories or glass roofs that you want to make, and consider grabbing a diamond or two in order to construct a modification station. To collect the materials, I recommend using a cyclops paired with a prawn suit to make the process as streamlined as possible. When it comes to estimating material costs, I like to abide what I refer to as the 50% rule. That is, however many materials you think you are going to need, get 50% more. Trust me, these bases can get expensive quickly, and there is nothing more annoying than having to stop what you're doing because you ran out of glass halfway into building your base. Step 3. Exterior Design Time for the step you have all probably been waiting for. It is time to begin construction on our base. I like to start out my bases by building the largest modules first. In this case, that is the large room, but for smaller bases, it might just be the moon pool. 
For your exterior, there are many different design variants you can utilize. For bases such as Leviathan Observatories, where the main focal point is high above the ground, I will often go for a towering design, where most of the base is high up, while keeping a smaller section on the ground to visually anchor the structure. Another great option is the staircase design, which is perfect for sloping terrain, and it can be used to focus a base's view towards a particular location. With smaller bases, you can integrate them into the terrain much easier, which really helps set the base into the environment that it's in. For this base, I'm going to be wrapping my multi-purpose rooms and moon pools around the large central rooms. Not only will this help create a symmetrical design that matches the futuristic aesthetic, but it will help reduce dead ends and should make the base feel larger than it actually is. I would also like to note that I'm only using two large rooms in this space. For reasons I will get to later, I would really recommend you not to use too many large rooms, and even outright avoid them in some cases. After I get the moon pools in place, I begin connecting them to the multi-purpose rooms. I also try and add in some elevation changes, as this should make the interior a bit more interesting. Eventually, I get all of the dimensions figured out and connect everything with glass compartments. I make sure to add a scanner room to one end, and place an observatory in the opposite side to keep things looking balanced. With that done, it's time to address those 50 million hull failure warnings we've been getting. I start adding some reinforcements, taking care not to block any of the best views, and then begin the long process of juggling hull strength with windows. On the bigger base pieces, it is especially important to add windows, as these help bring much needed light and color into these spaces. Once you finish adding in the windows, your hull integrity might be very low, and since you still may have to change around a couple things once you get inside, it is good to create a small buffer zone. One way to do this is with foundations, which can add to a base if not used too excessively. These are also good for adding outdoor grow beds, which I will be doing later. Finally, I'm using bulkheads to subdivide the sea base into three separate watertight compartments. These will help me establish my interior layout and are quite useful in ensuring that your base doesn't completely flood. Step four, interior design. Now that we have a solid base that won't flood, it's time to work on draining the water out of it. While inside, I'm using this opportunity to place ladders between the various levels and make sure that everything is connected up nicely. Around now is when I also like to start thinking about a base's interior layout. I decide I would like to include a galley, living quarters, a lab, an office, an aquarium, a greenhouse, a storage room, and a reactor room. To avoid jumbling up the interior too much, I split the base into three separate parts. The large middle section will be the mechanical heart of the base, containing a reactor room alongside storage and crafting. The right-hand section will be the work portion of the base, housing a lab, alien containment unit, and a greenhouse. Finally, the last remaining section will serve as more of a leisure area, having the galley, living quarters, and office. With the base drained, I place some solar panels out on the foundations, which will allow me to breathe freely while working inside. Similarly to how I built the exterior, I find it best to tackle the largest spaces first and gradually work my way to the smaller rooms. Now remember when I said you should limit your usage of large rooms? Well, these rooms can leave you with so much space you have trouble figuring out what to do with it all. They're almost too big. I add in an alien containment as a centerpiece for the room, and then move downstairs to install two nuclear reactors. Solar is great and all, but it just won't cut it when you're charging ion power cells. One thing I like to do with plant pots is to use one type for each kind of space, such as regular plant pots in the moon pools and large rooms, composite plant pots in the multi-purpose rooms, 
and chic plant pots for the corridors. I finish up the reactor room, then begin work on the moon pools, adding a vehicle upgrade console, some charging equipment, and of course, more plant pots. With that completed, I began working on the various multi-purpose rooms around the base. There's no particular order to this, I just build whatever room I feel I have the most ideas for at any given time. To get better at building, it can be very helpful to experiment, using the various furniture pieces in new and interesting ways. For this last multi-purpose room, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. Then I got the idea to put several desks directly adjacent to one another to make a large table, and I ended up turning the space into a conference room. Real quick, if you're enjoying the video so far, it would be great if you could leave a like. The support on the last video was absolutely insane, and I'd love to see if we could reach 2,000 subscribers by the end of the month. Alright, back to the video. I placed some benches down along some of the glass corridors, and with that, the interior was more or less finished. Step 5. Lights, Flora, and Fauna Now that we've finished everything else, it's time for the final step. I go outside and begin collecting samples of local flora, as well as some fish. For aquariums and alien containment units, I find using local fish and plants helps set the base into the environment. Next, I head back outside and plant creep vine, blood kelp, gel sacs, acid shrooms, and deep shrooms in the exterior grow beds. These are the most useful for crafting, and it is great to always have plenty on hand. Moving on to the interior flora, I begin seeding all of the pots and grow beds. Once the plants begin to mature, it's easy to see just how much of a difference they can make. Not only do the plants and fish tanks give the base a much needed touch of color, but they also help add a sense of life to these otherwise bare titanium shells. Now we move on to what is perhaps the most underutilized base feature, exterior lighting. Since you will spend most of your time inside of the base, it can be easy to write off excess lighting as wasteful and unnecessary. But trust me when I say a few flood lamps and searchlights can go a long way in improving your base. And with those finishing touches, our base is now complete. I'd just like to take a second to welcome all of the people who came here from my last video. The channel growth this past week has been incredible. I have no idea if this video will do anywhere near as well, but I hope you found it enjoyable and informative nevertheless. Anyways guys, I will see you next time. Have a good one.